I think it's fair to say that most couples who break up don't like each other. Many have a great deal of difficulty communicating and cooperating with each other on even the simplest matters, like arranging pickups and drop-offs for their children on access visits. But for a narrow group of separated parents, the animosity and hostility becomes toxic. When one parent hates the other so much that he or she can't bear the thought of their child having a healthy, loving relationship with the other parent, we're entering the realm of parental alienation. Brought to you by AdviceScene.com. Free legal answers from verified lawyers. Parental alienation. Why do some parents do everything within their power to turn their children against the other parent? How does the justice system deal with this serious problem? And what can be done to help children in this situation? We'll be talking with a senior family law lawyer, Lauren McLean. And we also have a rare opportunity to hear from a woman who says she was victimized by parental alienation as a child. Her name is Rhonda Pisanello, and she's a strong advocate in the campaign to protect children from venomous parents. Lauren, Rhonda, thank you so much for joining us here on Family Matters. I want to ask you, Rhonda, can you tell us what you went through as a child? Um. I can, in 1973, my parents got a divorce. And how old were you then? I was 10 years old. And my father was actually awarded custody. And my mother was given access to see us on weekends. Um, about a month after the order was granted in the um, Peace River Courts, um, my father um, took us over to England. Um, the court did grant an order for that in the Edmonton Courthouse. Was your mother part of that court case? No, she was not there. Her lawyer was not there. There was no one. She didn't know. And why did your father move you and your siblings to England? To go to work in the offshore rigs in the North Sea. So he had an, a job there. And you're saying that he got a court order without notice to your mom right. to move you and your siblings to England without her consent, without her knowledge. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see your mom again? Um, once we went to England, no, I didn't see her until um, I was 18, and I came back to Canada. What were you told as a child about your, what was going to happen in terms of your relationship with your mom? Um, we were told that she didn't want us. Uh, we were told that she didn't love us anymore, and she was tired of looking after kids and ch changing diapers and just all those nice things. Um, when did, you, did you ever get a chance to say goodbye? No. They didn't know where we were. And um, we didn't know where we were going until we were on the airplane, in the air going to England. And so when you got to England and you were told that your mom didn't want you, didn't love you, you went how long before ever seeing her again? It was um, eight years, just about. Eight years? Yes. And then how did you reconnect with your mother? I. Um, when I was 17 and a half, I ran away from my father and stepmother and um, went into hiding basically in Doncaster in England until I was turned 18. And once I turned 18, um, I returned to our town in Doncaster and I started to look. I couldn't remember names, I couldn't remember places, but I could remember the name of my grandfather's theater, so I called there overseas to from England to Canada. That must have been a very emotional reconnection with your mom when it, you finally it, found her. Yes, very, very emotional. <laughs> Hard for both of us. Did you talk about your mom to your dad and your stepmom when you were in England and ask if you could see her or contact her? No, we weren't allowed to speak about my mother um, to anybody. Uh, our stepmother was um, called mom. We were told to t call her that the day they got married and no one was supposed to know that we um, had a different mother. Tell me something. This is, a, 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 as I in indicated in the intro, this is very rare to speak to someone who went through this as a child. How do you feel that, that the alienation that you experienced from your mother affected you in your life, in your own 
well-being as a person? I was lost. Um, I had no self-worth. I didn't feel um, good for anybody. I, I was treated as a traitor in my father's home for speaking or trying to speak about my family that was left behind. And I believed what they told me to an extent that the, my family in Canada, my maternal family, didn't want me either. So I was right in, in the middle of nowhere, and I had no, um, nothing to connect to, felt like I was drifting. I think you mentioned uh, that you even had an emotional breakdown, mental health problems. Yes, I attempted suicide three times in my life. The last time I was 32, I had just had my third child, and I, I had no reason. Like, I, I didn't know what was wrong, but I just couldn't connect to anything for all those years. I struggled. And did your siblings ever get to reconnect with, uh, with your mom? No. Um, she passed away in 2007, and they, it was 34 years had gone by since we left on the airplane, and she never saw them again before she passed away. It's a harrowing story that we've just heard, uh, actually very, uh, very emotionally powerful. Uh, even for me as a judge who listens uh, to uh, a lot of tragedy every day, when we come back, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to be asking uh, our guest lawyer, Lauren McLean, to tell us uh, about his experience representing parents in, uh, in cases where alienation has occurred. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Family Matters. We're discussing parental alienation today with our guests, lawyer Lauren McLean and advocate Rhonda Pisanello. Lauren, you've been a lawyer for 28 years in family law. What's your reaction to what you've just heard from uh, Rhonda? You see some of the indicia of the sort of the trauma that the child suffers when an abnormal parent fails to recognize that a child shouldn't forfeit the love and guidance of two caring and concerned parents merely because of marriage breakdown. So the cases are rare, but when they do occur, the results for all parties are devastating. It's not just a situation where the targeted parent has an unhealthy relationship with the child. It's also the child's unhealthy relationship with the custodial parent or the parent that's actually involved in the alienation, which is equally as sick. And only when you deal with all three parties can you get the family healthy again, and hopefully the outcome will be a satisfying post-separation relationship of all parties with the child. Now I want to ask you, you say that the, the parental alienation, true parental alienation is rare. That's my experience too. I think it would help our viewers to define it uh, because we, uh, uh, parents have been behaving badly for years. It's not new. And uh, it, it, it happens, unfortunately, that kids get caught in the middle of parental disputes. But we're talking about something much more severe, aren't we? We are. I mean, when uh, two parents get together, they see the positives and the negatives, and overall they believe that their spouse is, is an overall net positive. Unfortunately, at the end of a marriage, they tend to focus more on the negative. Most people move past that very quickly and recognize that, you know, parents are forever. The children need both parents. But when Some they get parents, to alienation, though... Uh, how do you, you have to distinguish it from cases where a child may justifiably not want to have contact with a parent. Right, let's talk about the definition then. So it will tend, parental alienation will tend to occur in a high conflict case. It's marked by a rejection and denigration of the child to the other parent that reaches the level of a campaign. Secondly, it's not justified, so it's not due to deficiencies in the targeted or the access parent. And third, there is an active involvement by the custodial or the primary residential parent that is driving this denigration and rejection. If you don't have all three of those factors, you don't have parental alienation. Estrangement would occur from the access parent, for example, if they have deficiencies in parenting. They're unavailable, they're overly strict, they're too lax, there's drug and alcohol problems, or there's been physical or sexual abuse. Those are justified reasons for the child not to want to go to the parent. That's not parental alienation. And I can tell you that as a judge, it's often very difficult to be able to distinguish between the two because parents come to court accusing each other of all kinds of things, often with no proof. And, you know, I, I don't think I've ever yet seen a, a case where a child did not want to have a relationship with their non-custodial parent 
that the custodial parent didn't say to me, well, it's, it's the non-custodial parent's fault. It's their fault. That's why. It's not that it's, I haven't done anything wrong. It's, it's, it's that parent. That parent doesn't, uh, doesn't know how to be a good parent. That's the problem. And what we find, and one of the strategies uh, I will approach a case with, and I think it's important for a family lawyer to deal on both sides of this issue. So I do not just act for parents who say it's parental alienation. I act for parents who are wrongfully accused of being a, a, an alienator. But to get a judge involved at the beginning that will stay through the case throughout, to get a psychologist who's experienced with parental alienation, estrangement, other concepts such as adultification and parentification, right at the start, because if you delay, the issue tends to get worse. And it's kind of a form of brainwashing, poisoning a, a child's mind against the other parent with no justification at all. Right, you've got inculcation going on, you've got a child who loses, this is one of the other hallmarks of parental alienation, loses the ability to critically think. So that child no longer thinks for themselves, begins to identify with the parent, uh, sees white knight, black knight, good and bad, will only remember negative uh, sort of histories of the, of the access or targeted parent and sees no good, shows no guilt over this and is not ambivalent in any way. Rhonda, does yes. any of this sound familiar to you? Yes, yes, very much. Um, when we did speak about her mother, they, we, she was called the thing. That's how the family referred to the her. The thing. The thing. And um, she... Um, when I did try and tell my younger sister, who had no idea what was going on, um, I got the belt from my stepmother the day it happened. When and you say you got the belt, you were beaten? Beaten with a leather two-inch western belt, um, told to lay down on the bed and remove my pants. And so you, you suffered physical abuse as a result of the alienation as yes. well. I yes. want to ask you, Lauren, what kind of conduct do we see? What alienating behavior? We've heard about physical abuse. We've heard about an abduction, which is a pretty extreme form of alienation. One of the things you'll look at, first of all, is uh, has the targeted parent previously had a very good relationship with the child? And that suddenly, after the separation, that relationship starts to decline. Uh, the child starts to denigrate, the child starts to refuse, uh, and in more serious cases, the child will actually run away uh, or, or maybe raise false uh, allegations of abuse, for example. So you see a continuum of it. Unfortunately, the longer it goes on, as you were saying, the harder it is to undo that kind of, of, of damage to a child. One of the problems is, too, that the targeted parent will somehow think perhaps it's their fault or maybe they're putting too much stress on the child by trying to see them, and that access parent will withdraw, which is probably the worst thing they can do. Because you mean that just walk away? Walk away or withdraw or start giving up on the access, which just lets the alienating parent have more time to complete their job. Well, it's understandable, I guess, it, uh, that a parent might be so over, overwhelmed by this that they would walk away. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to be asking Lorne uh, what the courts, how effective the courts are in addressing parental alienation, and we're going to talk about the advocacy that Rhonda has been doing to help others. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to Family Matters and our discussion of parental alienation. I got some tough questions for you, Lorne. Judge to lawyer, shoot. I'm going to give you some remedies that courts traditionally use uh, to address parental alienation uh, and see what you think. Um, police enforcement. A court orders that the police shall enforce the access and go and get the kids and deliver them to the access parent. I think in cases where there's been sort of prolonged denials, it makes sense. Sometimes you don't want the heavy hand of the police showing up and the impact on the child, and you can turn in an alienation case that somehow turns the alienating parent into a bit of a martyr in the child's eyes. Oh, they called the police on mom or they called the police on dad, for example. So it uh, depends on the circumstance. But yes, I agree, it, it does fit in certain circumstances. It's got to be scary for a child to have the police come, especially if the child's been brainwashed and really believes that the other parent is someone evil. It's got to be scary. Oh, exactly. And, and what you see is these, these children have this sometimes intense fear in the serious cases, 
but based on very frivolous or, or unsubstantiated allegations. And so in younger children, they will uh, make something up that you can clearly tell is, is the words of the parent. And those are sort of tip off and alarm bells. So the alarm bells will start to ring when that happens. I find that um, in many cases, if a child is adamant that they won't go and the child's older than a baby, the police won't push it. That they do have a discretion to say we're not going to force a child kicking and screaming to an access visit. Right, and, and you know, you have to ask yourself, uh, and, and in cases when a judge will force a child to go, is it in the child's best interest not to see this caring parent no matter how adamant the child is? And my view is that if it is in the child's interest and that parent is capable of providing a loving and safe home for them, that the courts shouldn't be afraid of making that child go because Rhonda may tell us this, secretly that child may wish that someone will step in and make them go so the pressure's taken off of them. Well, it sounds like in your case, Rhonda, you never really were brainwashed. You, you didn't really believe the negative things that were being said to you about your mom. Um, to a degree, I did believe some of the things that my mom may not have wanted to be with us, as we were told, but the bond I had with my grandmother was, is what pulled me through, I think, up and out of the alienation, whereas my two younger sisters succumbed to it more than I did. They totally bought the yeah, negativity. I, yes, and I never, so. never. So they must have not been thrilled to see you run away and go and find your mom. I believe so. I haven't seen them for 17 years either. So I, I. <laughs> so there's another thing, Lauren, that even among siblings it causes dissension and, 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 and ruptured relationships. Well, it's sometimes the concept of the cult. So now she's discommunicated because she has uh, turned against uh, the leader of the cult, which, which in your case was your father. It's not always women. It's very important to know that. That's right. Uh, it can be either parent. Uh, another remedy that we see in the courts is contempt of court. A motion asking the judge to find the custodial parent in contempt and to send that parent to jail. Okay, so contempt of court hard to prove, more of a criminal standard, and parental alienation cases are notoriously sort of hard to prosecute. The courts will not want to believe it in the first instance. It will take a lot of, of denials of access or interference of access before a court will act, because a court would not believe that most normal parents would do this. Unfortunately, you're not dealing with a normal parent in a parental alienation situation, so contempt can work. It's heavy-handed. I'd rather see two-for-one replacement access. For every day of access that is denied, two should be given back because what happens is the alienating parent will try to deny that access knowing the other parent will go and worst case scenarios they just get back the day that was denied. You've got to put some teeth in it so there's a downside to the alienator from those some actions. really effective enforcement. Exactly. You know, a couple of times now you've said this is not a normal parent. Is the, is the big elephant in the room that we are dealing with uh, someone, a parent who would do this to go to such a length? Yeah, it has a mental health problem or a personality disorder? Psychological studies show that, that there's a high uh, rate of psychopathology in a parent that would do this. And just think about it. You know, a normal parent would not do it. And so if this is a good parent in every other respect except for this psychopathology, I say they're not a good parent because they are uh, breaking the bond with another equally important parent and that shows they're not in a position to make proper decisions. They shouldn't have custody. Well, Rhonda, was your dad... Uh, Outside of the alienation issue, how would you describe him as a parent in terms of meeting the rest of your needs, getting you to school, like taking care of your health, your education? He was absent. He was never there. He worked um, three weeks, four weeks at a time. We were left in the care of our stepmother. And so this wasn't a case of a parent uh, really stepping up to the plate himself as a primary caregiver. No, he handed over the job to her. Well, I'm going to keep the pressure on Lauren. Um, another remedy that courts are asked to impose is to actually change custody, which is very severe. Have you had experience with, uh, with uh, seeking to actually change the custodial placement of the child? Yes, I have. So what will happen in, in the first <clears throat> instance is you will go to court, you will get your court order. Uh, if you don't, aren't successful in getting custody, you'll have your access. If access problems develop, I like to proceed back aggressively and go for something like a shared custody. Because if there's alienation going on, if I can get it to at least shared custody, at least half of the time that child's in a normal home. If the alienation continues and it's shared custody, then the court has to go to the stage of considering the transfer of custody. And again, you have to take into account the effect 
on a child who is refusing to go to that parent, being forced to go, versus, I say, the longer-term harm of leaving him with a custodial parent who's psychologically damaged. And then you may move on to cutting the access off even after you've changed custody to the parent and doing what is called a parentectomy, where you remove that parent for a while to allow the bond between the targeted parent and the child to heal. And then in turn, you reintroduce that parent, the custodial parent or ex-custodial parent, and try to get their bond healthy again. So it's really complicated. Well, you can see that uh, the justice system has its work cut out for it when these kinds of allegations are made in terms of really figuring out what's best for the child. In the few remaining, remaining minutes, though, I, I want Rhonda to tell us, you are on the board of the Parental Alienation Awareness Organization. Can you tell us very briefly what that organization's mandate is? Yes. Um, their goal is to educate and uh, create awareness throughout, um, internationally, actually, um, about the harmful long-term effects parental alienation behaviors have on children. Um, they focus on the children. Um, they don't take a position in um, such things as a syndrome, whether or not it exists. It's, um, they've been, we were founded in 2005 by Sarvi Emo, and they're based in Oakville, Ontario. Well, I want to hear more about it right after this break. Welcome back to our remaining moments of Family Matters, talking about parental alienation. I am holding up a teddy bear here that I understand is given out by your organization to kids. Yes. And on each hand, one says, Dad loves me, one says, Mom loves me. Yes. How can people get one of these? Um, they can go to the website. It's um, www.paawareness.org, and um, you can order them on there. Well, that's great. I hope people will support that organization. Any final words, Lauren? Harvey, people often ask me who the winners in divorce are, and I always say it's parents that can move on to a satisfying post-divorce life without any bitterness and recriminations, and that know that children need a healthy relationship with both parents after separation. Well said. Couldn't do it better myself. I think every judge would agree with me. Parental alienation cases are among the most difficult we have. Hope this show will help you get more information about it. From all of us here at Family Matters, thanks for watching. See you next time.